Hello, and welcome to the 19th annual and the first ever virtual Green Living Festival. This is Green Living Day, Saturday, June 6, 2020. I'm Jean Ponzi from the Earthways Center at the Missouri Botanical Garden, and we, the Earthways team, the Sustainability Division of the Garden, are bringing you this festival through the magic of electrons and extraordinary collaboration and cooperation of champions of green living from around our community. It's absolutely the top of our list, our presenting sponsor, Ameren, Missouri. Thanks so much to Ameren for supporting and energizing these efforts to bring you sustainable solutions we hope you can use, loosely grouped in the topical areas of green living on Tuesday, June 9th, energy, and on Thursday, June 11th, naturescaping. All of these events, access to the live ones like today's panel, and to many recorded resources can be found at mobot.org slash greenlivingfest. This is a live panel addressing food waste, issues and actions. And we wanna thank our workshop sponsor, Spire, presenting this live panel and other live panels on our additional days and a number of other workshops. Today's participants are coming to us from the Missouri Coalition for the Environment, St. Louis County Department of Public Health, St. Louis Composting and Total Organics Recycling, and East West Gateway Council of Governments, specifically the 1STL Regional Sustainability Program. So I'm going to let our um, speakers come online here. Want to welcome you all. You can just, Rachel Greathouse from St. Louis Composting, Gina Jane, from 1STL and East West Gateway Council of Governments, Ray Miller from the Missouri Coalition for the Environment, and Margaret Lilly from St. Louis County Department of Public Health. Today's session is being recorded so that people can take advantage of it and um, uh, be a part of this learning opportunity in an ongoing way. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function on your Zoom webinar control. And Joyce Gorell of our Green Living Festival team is gonna be moderating those questions. We're gonna go right now to the presentations by our panelists, and we'll go right through the four of them, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So please do type in your questions when they come up, and we'll, have, uh, we'll come back to this um, gallery view for dialogue to answer those questions. So, Ray Miller from the Missouri Coalition for the Environment, local food coordinator. Welcome and take it away. Thank you, Jean. Hello, everyone. My name is Ray Miller. As Jean said, I'm the local food coordinator for Missouri Coalition for the Environment, or NCE. Uh, in this position, I work really closely with uh, local farmers here in Missouri and Illinois that raise livestock or uh, produce. I also work closely with um, the, the main customers or buyers, uh, organizations and companies that purchase and support uh, these farmers in the area. And today I'm gonna to talk with y'all a little bit about uh, food waste and food systems with a local food perspective. I'm just gonna do an overview for you here. Thank you. So you see food waste generally in three areas. Uh, the first being on farms themselves, the second being at places where we go to purchase most of our food, such as grocery stores, restaurants, uh, caterers, dining halls, and the third being um, at our very own home. Uh, so when we're looking at food waste on farms, I would venture to say that just about every farm has food that they grow that doesn't make it off the farm into the hands and the mouths of, of a person to, to be consumed. Now, I think there's two main reasons for this. Uh, one of them is not all the food has a a buyer or a customer. Um, the other main reason is that um, there's, a, there's a labor shortage on most farms. As you might know, most farmers are working well over 40 hours a week and they have a hard time finding good committed staff to work on their farms. And therefore, oftentimes there's food left out in the field that's ready to be harvested and eaten, but there's just not the time of the day to prioritize harvesting that food. Um, a great example is uh, you've got a bed of kale here at the bottom of the slide. You know, it might take one of your staff people an hour or two to go out and harvest the kale, wash it, bunch it, package it, and get it ready for sale at market. And meanwhile, you don't have a 
a confirmed customer or buyer for that kale. So you might have something else more time sensitive to do on your farm and that kale is just going to sit there in the field. Now, food waste on farms isn't a bad thing in and of itself. Um, most farmers, they use this unwanted food on their farms to feed their um, compost piles or to feed the animals on their, on their farms as well. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, this depends on the volume you're looking at. Now, second, when we're looking at grocery stores, you may be familiar with, you know, a lot of grocery stores do great work with donating their unwanted extra food to food pantries or food banks. Um, however, there are several grocery stores that might only have this process set up certain days of the week, or maybe they don't have it set up at all. So there's still a great opportunity to reduce the amount of food waste that's happening at places like grocery stores. And furthermore, uh, once that food gets to a food pantry or a food bank, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's getting into the hands and the mouths of a hungry person. You know, a lot of this food is, it's got a ticking time bomb. It's going to be almost bad already. So it's, it's, there's a logistical challenge to keeping that food moving quickly enough and getting it to a person. Also, when we're looking at places like caterers um, or dining halls where you have pre-cooked food, there's, there's a great food safety risk in trying to save the extra unwanted food that remains at, at the end of an event, for example. Now, there are options there, but it is challenging to, to move that food to another location to be rescued in a safe way. And then you can look at our, our homes. I, I would imagine many of us experience food waste at our own homes and our refrigerators. Um, it's pretty common. And I'll expand on that in the next slide. So some common and unnecessary food waste practices. You know, uh, we can look to things like expiration dates. A lot of food is thrown out because it's past the expiration date. That could be at our own homes and that can also be at grocery stores and other places. There are some strong opinions out there about the use of expiration dates and the validity behind them. Um, there's also things like ugly produce. I think we're raised in an environment where we really value beautiful, pretty food. Um, this photo in the slide here is actually of you know, what would be called ugly apples. Uh, they're actually produced by an organic farm. So here we have like a great example of the reason why they're ugly is actually because they're more healthy. They haven't been treated with chemical sprays that remove the blemishes um, are these little bug holes that you might see. Another place is uh, pre-portioned meals. So we're looking at like dining halls where you're using um, tray service or all-you-can-eat buffets or restaurants that just generally serve a, a large portion of food. There's a lot of food waste happening in that space. And then overbuying. You know, I think looking at the overbuying that we, we often do in our own homes, you know, I think it's closely tied to the busy lives that we, that we lead and really only having the chance to go grocery shopping once or twice a week. And we buy as much as we possibly can to stock up. But I think that often is strongly correlated with having fresh food that we just don't quite make it to in time and we end up throwing them out. Next slide here. So some solutions to food waste. Um, on an individual level, you know, again, I think we can lean into eating our ugly veggies. I would love to encourage everyone, next time you're at the grocery store and you, you see a funky looking uh, piece of fruit or vegetable, I, I would strongly encourage you to, to, to buy that, you know, because it's very likely that it's going to get thrown out. Give it a taste, you know, I bet it's probably uh, just as delicious as the beautiful one next to it. Um, be skeptical of these expiration dates. You know, if you're at home and you have something past the expiration date, give it a whiff, Give it a taste, see what you find out. You might be surprised that it's really just, just fine. Um, in, re in regards to this overbuying that we tend to do, I would encourage folks to try to buy less if you can at all. Try to go more often and, and get less things with each trip. And we can learn about how to best store different items in our fridge so that they can last longer. And then when something is going to go bad, you know, you can freeze your fruit, you can pickle your vegetables. There are different things we can do to use up that food uh, rather than throwing it out. And then if you get to the point of, of it's too far gone, there's nothing more you can do about it, you know, composting at home is really going to do a great service in reducing the amount of food that's going into our landfills. Um, 
there's a lot of information on the, on the internet about different ways you can build composting in your yard if you have one. Um, if you don't have access to composting at home, there are things like share waste. You can um, compost with someone else in your neighborhood who might have a compost pile that you can access. Um, I won't get too much into that because our further panelists are going to dive more into those things. But the more you know, spread the words to your friends and family about the different ways you can help reduce food waste as an individual. And then on a systematic level, um, I would love to see an increase in the, in the amount of food rescue efforts happening in St. Louis. We have great things like the Campus Kitchen, which is a national nonprofit that has presence here in St. Louis at WashU and SLU, at least. Um, and these folks, they use kitchens to rescue donated food or sometimes even pre-cooked food um, to make it into something that's healthy and edible and they get it to folks that can eat it quickly. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunity. There are other cities around the country that have efforts in place where if you're at a large event and the catering, there's a lot of extra food left over, you have an organization or you have a person you can call and they will come grab that food and safely get it to someone that can consume it. So I think there's, there's a lot of room to grow in that space here in St. Louis. Then of course, food system reform. You know, we need food system reform in so many different ways. Um, in regards to food waste, there's a lot of talk around reforming these expiration dates because a lot of food is being thrown out based on those things. Um, when we're talking about composting, you know, the, you can again look to other cities around the country and see these residential composting services that exist. That's certainly something uh, that we could look into here in St. Louis. And then lastly, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, regarding the on-farm food waste, um, Missouri Coalition for the Environment, where I work, and Operation Food Surge are partnering to launch a pilot gleaning program later this month. And so gleaning, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, volunteer harvesters that go out to the farm and harvest that unwanted food, harvest that food that a farmer doesn't have a buyer for and doesn't have time to harvest themselves. So we're getting ready to launch this program. Uh, we're really excited about it. We think we can make a big difference in the amount of food being wasted in our local food system here in St. Louis. And I'll leave it at that for today. Thanks, Ray Miller from the Missouri Coalition for the Environment. Thank you very much. I, I've got some notes for questions for you when we go on. Now right. I'd like to call up um, Margaret Lilly from St. Louis County Department of Public Health. Margaret's got the you can do portion of this to expand a little on what Ray just mentioned about ways that we can all reduce food waste in the personal ways that we handle it. Margaret? Okay, hello everyone. I'm going to echo some of the things that uh, Ray just presented and um, I work for the St. Louis County Department of Public Health, where I am the environmental supervisor for the Waste Diversion Program. So our program is tasked with reducing waste entering landfills, and we do this through education programs, municipal grants, and community outreach. The way we manage food is a topic that touches many parts of the health department. So our coworkers are the food sanitarians that inspect restaurants, and the communicable disease specialists and epidemiologists that investigate and track foodborne illnesses in St. Louis County. So food waste is a really important topic. Our education offerings include composting, but what is most near and dear to our hearts is preventing food waste in the first place because food is meant to be eaten. What I'm offering today is just three simple strategies that everyone can use to safely reduce the amount of food that we throw away. Some of these tips are really obvious, but they bear mentioning again because some of them make a really big difference. So the first strategy would be to be a better shopper. So here are a couple of things that have worked really well for me. When I'm making a list for someone else to follow in my home, I will write down the ingredients for the meals I am planning all the ingredients. And before they go to the store, they check the pantry and the fridge to, and cross off every ingredient that we already have. This seemed really time consuming in the beginning when I started it, 
but it's really paid off. Not only do we waste less food, but it's also cut down to any extra trips we make to the store. So I've done a list, of, done a bit of research about food waste and in interviews, one of the issues many people have identified is problems with wasting produce. So when we shop, we think in terms of how much food we need to make to serve our families. And that doesn't always correlate to how many pounds of produce I need to be purchasing at the supermarket. And so one of the things that we suggest people to do is to use that scale. So using the scale at the store is really key in gauging how much produce you actually are buying and what you actually need. This is also really, really handy when you're purchasing groceries online. So I have older friends that are purchasing groceries online a lot now and having a chart like the one that um, I found on Farmer's Almanac, which I believe is the next slide, has been really, really useful. So this chart is kind of cool because it tells you how many pounds of produce you're buying at the grocery store and then how many cups of whatever it is makes when you get it home. It also takes into account whether you're serving something cooked or whether you're serving it raw. So um, before we recommended this chart, a colleague and I tested it out and it's pretty accurate. Um, one of the things that's also cool is that you can get this online from the Farmer's Almanac website. They have a lot of interesting tools there. Restaurants use charts like this all the time to estimate how much waste they're going to have from a certain um, vegetable or a certain thing like asparagus. Like asparagus, 56% of asparagus is wasted because of how much you have to throw away or trim off. So this is a really useful chart though that you can use um, when you go shopping and when you shop online for sure. Okay, the second strategy that um, we recommend is to Practice ways to prolong the freshness of your food. So storing foods at the correct temperature is really, really important. Part of that is making sure that you have airflow around the items in your refrigerator. So just as Ray mentioned, you don't wanna to go to the store and stock up and cram your refrigerator full of things because managing your refrigerator is really important. I think that everyone has had the experience of losing a leftover in the back of the fridge. Keeping that airflow around all of those items in your refrigerator also makes sure that they're maintained at the proper temperature. Another thought is that you can freeze food that you know will not, you will not be able to eat while it's still fresh. So overripe bananas are a really common example of a food that freezes well and can be eaten later in a variety of different ways. Things you wouldn't even think of can be frozen. Egg whites, for example, um, can be frozen really easily. And there are many, many trips, tick, excuse me, tips and tricks that you can find on, on the internet. So foodborne illness is a very real threat. We hear about it on the news when it involves the food supply or a restaurant, but the majority of food related illnesses occur from home. One really useful tool to learn about um, protecting yourself from foodborne illness is an app that you can download on the Play Store, or your app store um, for your iPhone or your Android and it's from USDA and it's called Food Keeper. So if you have a question about how long you can safely keep foods, it's a handy reference. The third strategy is to understand what food labeling means. So outside of products such as baby formula, there is very little regulation. Manufacturers apply date labels at their own discretion and then they can do that for a variety of different reasons. However, Pay close attention to labels such as expires on or use before dates. Sometimes the label will say that you need to use the product within so many days after opening the container. So those, those, those labels are very important to pay attention to. On the other hand, the best if used by label is mostly a suggestion. And this is what's caused a lot of people confusion. So the Food and Drug Administration is supporting the efforts of the food industry to make this the standard phrase. So if it's not absolutely critical that, that you use a food by this date, this is the phrase that they should be using. Best if used by only applies to unopened food. Once the package is opened, you need to refer to food safety guidelines. If food is obviously spoiled, abnormally soft, discolored, or has a strong unpleasant smell, 
discard it, no matter how properly or how carefully you've been or how short a time it's been stored, it's not worth getting a foodborne illness. Foodborne illness is, is, is a public health threat. So, but outside of that, using common sense, your senses are there for a reason. And uh, if you have any doubts about a food um, and it's past the best buy date, call the manufacturer. The manufacturers often have contact information on the labels and they can reassure you if their product is still safe to consume. So more information about food safety guidelines can be found at foodsafety.gov. And uh, it's a really interesting website. There's a lot of links to other places that can um, give you more um, hints on how to better use the food that we have. And by being better shoppers and protecting the freshness of our food and understanding the labels related to food safety, we can ensure that food gets eaten and that it's used for its highest purpose. And that's mostly what you know, we're, we're about when we talk about, about food waste in, in our program. So um, I encourage everyone to eat your leftovers and make our grandmas proud. Margaret Lilly, thank you so much for that practical advice. Margaret Lilly is the supervisor in the Waste Management Branch with St. Louis County Department of Public Health. Our next presenter is Rachel Greathouse. She is the Sustainability Coordinator with St. Louis Composting and Total Organics Recycling. They are an exhibitor in the Green Living Festival. Please check out their exhibitor page and exhibitor interview. And Rachel, you get to explain to us kind of the end of pipe solution for food waste and organic waste and the services that St. Louis Composting provides here in St. Louis. Thanks for being here. Thank you, thank you for having me. So um, yeah, we're really excited to be here and talk about composting on a commercial level. I'll kind of dive in a little bit about home composting too, but I'm so glad that Ray and Margaret got to speak before me. Um, it really speaks to um, how we all are beginning to work together that we have very similar solutions, so it's really exciting. Just uh, to kind of distinguish the two companies, we are sister companies, St. Louis Composting and Total Organics Recycling. Total Organics Recycling is the hauler that picks up um, commercial food scraps from um, places in the St. Louis metro region and St. Louis composting is the one that actually turns it into compost. So just a little differentiation there of what each company does. So next slide. So just to dive in real brief definition, what is compost? Um, just if people aren't familiar with it. Um, so it's the decomposition of organic matter over time. Usually this takes somewhere between four and six months to break down fully, but the components uh, of compost that are needed are heat, light, or heat, oxygen, water, and um, uh, time, you know. And so this takes about four to six months, as I mentioned. Um, we've got a couple of locations um, that we compost at. Um, and the great thing about compost is that um, the unique ability that it uh, soaks up water and it retains about six times its weight in, in water retention. Um, so that is one of the ways that compost is very beneficial. It's very similar to uh, if you were to imagine to walk out to the forest floor, for, uh, forest to it for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, we just kind of take the process and speed it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, same kind of concept. So go to the next slide. So commercially composting versus home compost is a little bit different. Pretty much everything you can compost at home on this slide with the exception of dairy products and meat products and oil. Um, but when we we're talking about commercially, if you think about a sandwich, um, you know, your breads, your meats, your dairies, your veggies, your fruit, um, and even liquids as well can be composted in a commercial compost system that we have. Um, for your backyard composting, you would just want to keep uh, fruit and veggies and um, you know breads in your backyard system. But this is a lot of the waste stream, right? When, when you think about recycling and then you add on composting, these are the two largest waste streams that we have in our own personal homes. Um, so by uh, composting at home and recycling, you're really taking down your waste stream a lot, which is really exciting. Okay, next slide. 
So why should we separate organics? Um, just like I mentioned with recycling, um, it is a valuable resource when it is separated out. When it's mixed in with your trash, there's no value that um, the food scraps have. Um, they're just ultimately deemed for the landfill. But when we're able to source separate them out, just like you're recycling, you would do that for, for your paper and your aluminum and cardboard, we're able to use it in a beneficial way. Um, this does reduce the waste in, um, in the landfill space, taking up landfill space, um, and reduces the methane gas production. Um, food and um, organic material in landfills are some of the largest contributors to methane gas that we have. Um, so by removing that and um, turning it into something useful, again, it's, it's the bottom of the chain, right? We do want food to get to hungry people and hungry animals first, but at some level it does need, um, it, it should go here at the last stop. Um, and the great thing about um, compost is that it does enhance soil structure when it's added to it. Um, so our, our soil here in St. Louis is very clay-like, um, doesn't have a lot of nutrients, it doesn't hold water very well. Um, so the adding five to 10% organic matter into our soil really helps improve it, especially when we're coming up on summertime, drought season happening, um, that, that can be a big factor. Go ahead, next slide. So just kind of a high level overview as to um, what does our composting system look like? How does the whole process work? So first we've got um, the first picture with the slide with the yellow tote in it. Um, that's, you know, at the local, uh, in this case, grocery store, um, where they're, you know, disposing of any food that's not edible for food donation or just not edible in general. So they can put it into the yellow totes. Our trucks come around, pick up um, based on their schedule what they need. Um, so here's our truck in the second slide emptying out the food waste. Um, we don't typically put it in just a pile like this. We um, put it in the next in the next picture where you see the the rows, what we call wind rows, and from there um, we cover it up and we let it sit there for four to six months. Over that four to six month period, we turn it once a month um, to add that oxygen back into the pile. You need oxygen, otherwise the microbes will die and microbes help break everything down so that it becomes a fine material, a fine compost. Um, so that last picture there is a picture of our windrow turner and that's what the machinery we use to turn the piles to add oxygen back into the piles, um, which is really, Neat, and then it's all done. So that's kind of the high level view. Um, like I said, it takes, takes several months to get to, but um, that's what we get. And I think my last slide is about resources. So um, St. Louis Composting, obviously we sell finished compost, um, so you can buy that from us. Um, Total Organics Recycling, we provide commercial compost pickup. So if you know a restaurant or business, a school, um, an attraction, like, you know, I'm thinking Missouri Botanical Garden or the zoo, so attractions. Um, we do, we service all those. The only thing we don't service is residential. Um, International Compost Awareness Week just happened, so that was really fun. It was the first week of May. I always encourage you to um, check that out, and there's a ton of great resources, um, and so it's just shortly after Earth Month, Earth Day. Um, so International Compost Awareness Week, it's a whole week long, it's the first week of May. Um, Share Waste was already mentioned, but um, this is a great app, it's free. It connects you to other residents who are looking for compost in their backyard. So that's another great way to um, connect locally with people who um, compost in their own backyard. Uh, I think the compost story by Kiss the Ground, um, it's a YouTube video, is one of the best explanations. It's about uh, five to 10 minutes long. It's a great explanation as to um, compost and why it's important. And then the last thing Margaret already mentioned, which I always appreciate, the Food Keeper app. This has saved me and my household many a times of knowing what food and how to store it properly, which is great. 
um, to keep it longer, fresher. Um, there's been so many numerous times where I don't know how to keep a food and how to store it well, um, or even if it freezes well. And I can quickly um, go onto the app or the website and check that out. So I'm maximizing my shelf life of my produce, especially. So, um, but yeah, these are great resources. I highly recommend them. And thank you for having me. Rachel Greathouse of St. Louis Composting, thank you very much. And thanks for, um, want to let folks know that the people who are speaking here today are representing a little bit larger group of food waste advocates, food waste reducing advocates, looking at what these issues are and how we might uh, start addressing them more rigorously in the St. Louis area, even, the, even more than the ways that we already are. Gina Jane is our fourth and final presenter in this portion of our local food issues, local food waste issues and actions panel. Gina is a sustainability planner with East West Gateway Council of Governments. And here we get the bigger picture and a larger goal that is part of um, what this is all about. Gina? Great, thank you so much, Jean. Um, pleasure to be on this panel with all these wonderful presenters today. Um, and yeah, we can just skip and get right into it. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so, yeah, we're talking about, I want to talk about how food waste fits into 1STL sustainability goals as well. Um, and we have the materials and recycling working group. Um, I put their target up there to reduce um, waste going to the landfill in, within the watershed, or sorry, waste shed by 30% by 2030 using this 2015 baseline. Um, and we know, according to the Missouri Statewide Waste Composition Study that was published in 2018, um, that food waste was identified to be um, the most prevalent uh, material accounting for 15% of uh, the statewide municipal solid waste stream. Uh, therefore, this target, um, you know, in order to reach this target, we really need to have this working group wanted to address this food waste directly. Um, so there's a food waste diversion subgroup, which is actually led by Rachel, who just presented. Um, and, and this group, I think, is just a great step in the direction towards creating a more concentrated um, effort in the region to explore, you know, how can we continue to and reduce waste um, at a bigger scale. Uh, so also the Missouri Hunger Atlas, which was published by the University of Missouri in um, 2016, states that 17% of households in Missouri are food insecure. And I'm sure that number has gone up recently. Um, and this is compared with what the national average was at 14%. And this is yet another reason why diverting food waste um, to those in need is of huge importance um, and understanding you know, these issues and barriers to diverting food waste from landfills has this dual benefit of reaching, you know, our regional target, but for this waste re reduction, but also the potential to increase food access in the region. Um, and it correlates to another working group that we have, which is um, the food access working group um, that's working on uh, addressing issues related to equitable food, equitable, um, food access. So, Next, I'm going to um, touch on the barriers to food waste diversion. Um, and I've been doing some um, research myself uh, for, for what, through 1STL, and we have identified a few really important ones um, through these uh, interviews with some of the folks that were on this panel, but also our from organizations represented on this panel. And um, I'm going to start with just the legislative, and I know we've talked about the food date labeling um, already, so I won't get into that, but there are regulations and regulatory inconsistencies that kind of hinder the transfer and use of edible food be between um, jurisdictions and interested parties. And, you know, these other hurdles exist with restrictions on both residential and commercial composting and use of human food as animal feed. And um, 
Missouri does not have any laws that bear on food date labeling, for example, and Illinois I think only has one um, related to eggs. And essentially, I know that there was mention of that really great Food Keeper app, um, but I believe that by streamlining federal and state laws around date labeling, um, policymakers could help divert foods. Um, and according to Refed, um, which is a nonprofit and um, network of businesses, nonprofits, and um, foundations and government leaders that are all trying to reduce food waste in the U.S. Um, they've put together a roadmap, and according to them, if if there was, you know, this streamlining of date labeling, um, that potentially 400,000 tons of food um, could be reduced from going into the landfill each year. Um, and then also awareness, you know, food can be a resource at all steps in the life cycle um, and education, training, um, and awareness building is needed for the, for the general public, businesses, and local governments um, to kind of disrupt this cycle that leads to food waste. And it's just really great listening to these other presentations where, you know, we're talking about the exact kind of information that needs to be spread um, amongst more and more people, um, you know, whether it's about buying and um, eating ugly produce or, you know, preserving meals and doing these, these different great tips that were just provided. Um, and then there's the logistics and economics of, of um, you know, these logistic hurdles to diverting food waste um, are at every level of this. And that's why I kind of put this really horrible uh, version of the recovery, food recovery um, triangle there. Uh, sorry, it's it's a bit blurry, but um, anyway, so now these kind of where I was going with that, I apologize, I lost track of my train of thought, um, that these kind of hurdles emerge from some interviews, um, including the cost of equipment for preserving food, um, connecting food manufacturers, restaurants, and even schools that have surplus food with organizations um, that use the food to feed, to feed people. And there's a lack of businesses that can collect food um, for composting in the region. I mean, St. Louis Composting is a great, um, a, a great composting company, um, but they're just one, and it would be great if we could have more opportunity um, to compost through that. And then, of course, transportation, Trans transporting food um, that is going to potentially go to waste to a place where it could be eaten or, um, you know, saved from the landfill is a logistical um, and, and costly thing to have to do. Um, so I want to talk about what is currently happening next. Um, so obviously this is a completely solvable problem um, that we have. We have some great solutions that we were just talking about, but really importantly, I think is this partnership um, that, you know, keeping developing partnerships um, and such as the, you know, the Food Waste Diversion Subcommittee um, that has come out of the Materials and Recycling Group and of course, the, you know, the relationship between MCE and Operation Food Search that uh, Ray mentioned, you know, this cleaning project. Um, and I also put on there just some other examples of like Maryland Heights pilot project where um, it was a, this is, this was a, a curbside food waste pickup pilot that was started because um, people in the neighborhood wanted to see that happen and happen and they reached out to the municipality and, and they were able to secure, you know, there's government funding to secure this. And um, these are great examples. That's a great example of just the first step to get composting in communities um, that want it. And um, I think we already mentioned the Campus Kitchen, um, which SIUE, SLU and WashU have all participated in. Um, and then the Green Dining Alliance, you know, sort of certified restaurants. Um, a lot of a lot of those restaurants um, do composting with St. Louis Composting, which is great. And there's just so much opportunity um, 
And I think I'm really looking forward to working more with Rachel and that subgroup um, for the food waste diversion, trying to find ways that we can, um, you know, make, make it possible to help raise awareness um, of all the great efforts that are going on. And um, yeah, so I really appreciate the opportunity to talk today. And um, I guess I'm now concluding the part of the panelists. So um, hopefully we can we have some good questions that we can talk about. Thank you, Gina Jane. Thanks very much. And the, the synergies here between, say, the recycling and materials working group and the food access working group and 1STL, these are really exciting developments after a couple of years of the individual working groups aiming toward their specific targets. So I'm going to um, stop sharing here, I believe, uh, if I can find the... <laughs> Hello. Hello, cursor. There we are. Okay, so um, panelists unmute and we'll get Q&A up. Joyce Gorell is monitoring our Q&A and we have the opportunity to have um, some discussion. Emily Andrews from the uh, U.S. Green Building Council sent in a question right away. She'd like to learn more about the gleaning program at Missouri Coalition for the Environment uh, with Operation Food Service. Who will do the work of harvesting? Are you looking for volunteers? Is anybody going to do a classic painting of gleaners in the field? <laughs> well, I know the answer to some of those questions. Um, yeah, so we will be, I, uh, we have a date set for the 16th of June. Um, I will be going out to the farm along with a staff person from Operation Food Search. Uh, we have an active post right now we're looking for up to 10 volunteers to join us that day to help us with a, a very safe social, social distancing um, uh, gleaning on the farm. We're all gonna keep six feet apart. Um, we are asking that folks that are interested in joining us have a little bit of experience uh, with backyard gardening or farming in hopes of, having, of being able to spend less time right next to each other with doing a hands-on learning. Um, I do have a, a link I could provide um, to, to send you uh, with more information if I can figure out how to technically do that. Give me a moment. You uh, should be able to type that into Q&A, Ray. Q&A, thank yep. you. I will work on that now. As far as the painting goes, I think that's a great idea. I haven't thought of it yet. Um, but yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd love to connect about that. Was it, that, was it Van Gogh? Who was it that did that painting of the gleaners? Oh. Rembrandt, I don't know, some famous guy with a paintbrush. <laughs> Um, let's see, you, I, I want to go back to what you were talking about at the very end, Gina, about connecting the dots between producers of food waste and the, the economics of transporting food waste. There's probably really good data about the, the, the value, the money lost through food waste and about health related issues of people dealing with malnutrition. Do we have enough good data? that can help make the case for investing more in whatever the systems are that would get, the, get more of food that can be eaten to the places that it's needed, whether that's to human or to animal consumers of that available food? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of good data already, but that there could be more, especially regionally. Um, but I think we, we need to really kind of coordinate with these different, um, you know, the producers and the, the, the people that are actually trying to transport and do all of the different steps along the way, um, because that's where there isn't enough, um, I think there could be more collaboration there in order to create a plan to make that system more effective. And like you said, you know, you have to show and prove that there is the economic reasoning that makes sense behind it as well. Um, so <laughs> these are some good challenges, especially that I think that, and I hope that this subcommittee um, will be looking at and trying to address and see, you know, how can we play a part, play a role in, in helping to, to move some of that idea forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a question I want to address to you, Rachel. Has there been any move to get uh, 
curbside composting for the city of St. Louis. You mentioned that there was a pilot in a neighborhood or a subdivision or two in Maryland Heights. Yeah, so as far as it, for the county, I'll start with them. Um, there have been some other individuals that have stepped in and Margaret, feel free to jump in and speak to this as well since this is the county related. But um, yeah, we have had some conversations with some other municipalities within the county of doing some curbside collection um, with their yard waste, kind of commingled with their yard waste as an add-on service. As far as the city goes, we haven't had any conversations on that front. I have looked into some other cities across the U.S. who have uh, some great models that I think would work for the city. Um, hopefully we can get some funding for those in the future and um, work with some partners on those. Um, but I think logistically speaking, the county would be kind of our first move, um, an easiest move um, to, to start residential curbside collection of, of organics. And then um, I think the city has some challenges with some backyard uh, like the dumpsters in the alleyway and stuff. Um, is it doable? I think absolutely. I just think um, we at St. Louis Composting and Total Organics need to grow a little bit more before we can fully um, get there with that um, system. And Margaret, I do want to ask you to, to address that on behalf of the Waste Management Branch, St. Louis County Department of Health, Public Health. I know your, your organization, your governmental entity has really taken some very strong steps to safeguard and require the providing of recycling to residents in the county and really stepped up and did some problem solving when we had some big local pinch points in addition to global ones for recycling in the uh, end of 2018. What, what's the thinking um, if this is in, the, you know, it's probably been in discussion somewhere about more compost collection for residents in St. Louis County? Yeah, so the uh, Maryland Heights pilot was funded through a grant program that, that the county has. We still have grant opportunities available to municipalities for um, the 2020 year that are open through, I believe, last day of August. We had to extend it because of all the current events. Um, so um, composting curbside is something we're interested in and developing. It's complicated. The education component of it is critical and sometimes trying to find all those players willing to take responsibility for holding their residents accountable for doing things correctly can be difficult. Mm -hmm. so there's some logistic challenges, but I think that it's something that's definitely in the future and we would love to have municipalities give us a call and say, hey, what can we do to, to start? That would be great. Over the years of going to National Recycling Congresses, that I you know, haven't been to one for a while, but those national conferences and getting to hear about composting programs in places like Alameda County, California and Portland, Oregon and Hennepin County, Minnesota, that was always really of interest to me to think about, to hear about and learn about the, the logistics of doing that way before we had the food waste composting permits that we have here. Another question for you, Rachel, the um, commercial, the collection of food waste from commercial customers, have you seen growth in that? Have you seen increases in number of customers of the, the quality and the quantity of food waste being diverted through those programs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'll be honest, I've only been here for about seven months. So I haven't seen, in, and during that time with COVID, um, I personally haven't seen a ton of growth, but from the start of our program back in 2014, we're almost around 400 customers. Um, picking up about 500 tons every week. So in that regard, like there has been a huge increase just from 2014. Um, that's only about six years old our program is and that's, you know, that's the growth that we've had with commercial composting. Um, but since I've been here, there really hasn't been too much of a growth, but uh, the people in the position before me have seen um, an enormous growth in um, food composting and as people are becoming more aware and Margaret made a great point about contamination with uh, composting the contamination uh, rate is it has to be nearly zero. Um, we say about three percent but even that causes us a lot of issues. So with recycling we've already faced a ton of issues with contamination but we go residential com um, 
composting, we have to really hit the forefront with a ton of education and consistent education um, continuously. Um, and so that means there's got to be a lot of money behind it um, so that we can make sure that we continuously um, are able to support residents. Um, because it's so new here in the Midwest, we really this is a very new concept in the last decade about composting. It's, it's you know, very new to us. I would be lost in a drift without my compost pile, but probably not in the majority yet. Ray Miller, question for you. The overlap between food waste generation, food waste issues and actions, and social justice concerns is such a big area of overlap getting people to, getting food and, and making food, the kind of things you were talking about, Margaret, about food keeping and, and good shopping, making best your, use of your food dollars to people who are struggling with low income and with, with nutrition issues. Do you want to comment on any of that? I know your colleague, um, Tasha Phoenix, is the food justice organizer there, but the food and farm program team works so closely at MCE. Yes, we do. Yeah, and absolutely. Um, I think everything we've brought up on today's presentation is, um, is folks that have less access to resources and privilege face these struggles and, and barriers even more than, than those that do um, along the whole chain, right? So having the education and the access and the understanding of fresh products, and then once you get them at home, how to cook them, how to preserve them, how to store them. Um, knowing how to, you know, what's nutritional, what's fresh, what you can get locally at what time of the year, all of these things, um, that information is, is less accessible. Um, so I think there's absolutely an overlap between those two areas of, of food access and food waste and um, equity and food justice completely. Um, yeah, I feel like that's a, we could do a whole uh, yeah. <laughs> conversation just, just on that. There's a lot you can dive into. Yeah. Um, and in terms of looking into the gaps in the network of data that could better make the case for food waste reduction, I'm sure there are some data points that could be better connected relative to public health, relative to, um, you know, the needs of children in low income families and school nutrition and that kind of stuff. So this group, again, this team is part of a larger group looking into food waste issues and actions. And it was very exciting to get to bring you to here together for the Green Living Festival. Margaret, I wanna direct this question to you. Share, I, I, was it you that put up sharewaste.com, that website? No. Or was it, okay. I, um, yeah, Rachel okay. and I both have that. Rachel had that up, okay, thanks. So um, one of our viewers didn't really know that resource existed. And there are no locations close to her in on the Southern Illinois side of the metro area. Do you know mm -hmm. how a site like sharewaste.com is being expanded or could be expanded? Yeah, so unfortunately, but fortunately, I don't know really, but uh, people have to sign up as someone that needs to. So when you're a user, you can sign up one of two ways. You can say, hey, I have compost to give or I want to receive compost. So um, I'm actually on there myself saying that I want to receive compost. So when you first created a login account, that's what you're basing it on. Um, so if there's no one in your area, that's because no one's signed up. So it's kind of, the more you get the word out, the more users will use it and the more sites that will be on there. I've had numerous people tell me um, that we're you know, bringing compost to me, say, you know what, I just found another user closer to me. So I'm going to stop coming to you and I'm going to go to someone else. That's awesome. The word is getting out there about share waste. And so, um, you know, it's just, it's kind of a word of mouth. Um, so share it, obviously. And um, hopefully someone will say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm actually collecting in my backyard. I, I should just sign up and put my, you know, name out there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and then just another point I want to ask you to comment on a little bit more, Margaret. I, I did an inventory of my pantry and of my freezer, and I cleaned out the science experiments in my refrigerator without my husband having to tell me I had to do it when we went into COVID sequester. That kind of 
that kind of inventory and tracking is really good. You mentioned keep air circulation around your refrigerator, but isn't there a difference between the freezer on your refrigerator and if you have a deep freeze and how you should manage that? Yeah, um, so freezers should be packed tight. That's the best way to keep food in a freezer is to pack it tight. But in a refrigerator, you really need that air circulation. So yes, yeah, that's a very good point. Good luck getting a standalone freezer these days. We had a, like a month and a half wait to order one. Um, question again about uh, back, oh, this is really good, backyard composting. What is St. Louis County doing? Um, Gina, you might want to address this from the other waste minimization partners, doing to promote backyard composting. We talked about, you know, running routes, curbside composting, right. et cetera. I personally feel the less, the less your compost has to travel, the greener it is. So say mm -hmm. a little bit about promoting and educating backyard composting. Yeah, backyard composting is a going concern in St. Louis County. We fund grants every year for municipalities that purchase things like earth machines. We do education. Um, we go out to communities and teach them about how to compost in their backyard. Um, you know, and talking about what kinds of foods do you eat? So what, what can you do with your diet that makes your food waste all compostable versus things that you can't compost? And yeah, so we, that's one of our more popular municipal grants is composting. So people buy composters for their citizens and then they have education and they come and collect them and then they report back and say, hey, yeah, you're later, I'm still using it and I love it. Especially um, when we had to, um, when we had to temporarily suspend yard waste collection we did have an uptick in people requesting information on how to compost their yard waste. We just have a few minutes left in this food waste issues and actions panel. I'm gonna ask you to go just write down the list, the order that you were presenters, your closing comments. Ray Miller from the Coalition for the Environment, start with you. Sure, um, yeah, my closing comments would just be, I think you know, we're taking steps towards reducing the food waste here and along the, the chain, there's so many places to capture food uh, that's currently being wasted. And we're working on it. We have a lot of great resources here in the area, a lot of great organizations doing good work. Um, and we've identified the work that still needs to be done. So we're just gonna keep moving, keep working. We'll see in the head. And um, Margaret, you were the next up, right? Your closing Yes, time. I was. So um, I guess our main message is um, food is meant to be eaten. And if we that better than we avoid a lot of the other problems that's associated with food waste. Rachel Greathouse, St. Louis Composting and Total Organics. Yeah, I am very excited about this group and um, if you want to be more involved, we would love to have you. More people to the table addresses the issues of food waste and um, just really excited to be a part of this group and keep the conversation moving for the St. Louis metro region. And once again, Gina Jane, you get to have the last word here. <laughs> oh, thank you. No pressure. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you to all the you know, panelists. Everything that we're doing together is really so important. Um, an issue as big as food waste really has to be tackled in a very massive collective manner. And I think that's what we're working towards. And I'm really happy and proud to be part of it. So um, yeah, just to echo what Rachel was saying, please reach out to us if you're interested in getting involved, if you want to learn more, um, you know, happy to, to hear from you. Thanks again to our panelists for this um, session of discussing food waste issues and actions. Ray Miller, local food coordinator from the Missouri Coalition for the Environment Food and Farms Program. Margaret Lilly, supervisor in the Waste Division of St. Louis County Department of Public Health. Rachel Greathouse, sustainability coordinator for St. Louis Composting and Total Organics Recycling. And Gina Jane, sustainability planner and 1STL coordinator, 1STL, our regional sustainability plan and action measures from East West Gateway Council of Governments. The Green Living Festival comes to you from the Earthway Center of Missouri Botanical Garden. The festival is presented by Ameren, Missouri, and on these virtual festival days, June 6th, June 9 and 11, we will have live events, and there is a wealth, a plethora of recorded material that you can watch and learn from and be inspired by at your leisure. You can find all of that at mobot.org slash 
Green Living Fest. On behalf of the staff and volunteers of the Earthway Center at Missouri Botanical Garden, I'm Jean Ponzi saying thanks for joining us. Thanks for the green things you do.